Hello and welcome to lecture number nine. Today's topic, World War II, The Battlefront. There are two primary themes to be addressed in this lecture. First, we'll discuss some background to the Second World War and American reactions to the fighting in Europe. Secondly, the lecture will explore the diplomacy and strategies developed by the Allied powers to defeat the Axis powers during the war. We will begin with some background to World War II. The prelude to the Second World War came with several acts of aggression undertaken by Germany under Adolf Hitler. Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933 at almost the same time Franklin Roosevelt did in the United States. He immediately rebuilt the German military and demanded living space for Germany, particularly in Eastern Europe. After securing Germany authority in Austria and Czechoslovakia, Hitler set his sights on Poland and invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. This began the fighting in World War II. This map identifies several locations in Europe associated with German aggression. In 1936, we see German troops occupy the Rhineland, which was supposed to remain demilitarized. In 1938, we see Anschluss, or unification, of Germany and Austria. By 1939, German troops occupied all of Czechoslovakia. Following the German invasion of Poland, the French and the British declared war on Germany in 1939. By the following summer, the Germans had invaded France with its famous Blitzkrieg, and France fell within six weeks. The British now stood alone. There were two major sets of alliances associated with World War II. I'll talk about the Allies first. These included Great Britain, France, and by the summer of 1941, the Soviet Union. The Axis powers included Germany, Italy, and Japan. President Franklin Roosevelt declared American neutrality as the fighting began in 1939 and most Americans supported this stance. However, people became shocked as the fighting continued in the months thereafter. The United States then began to prepare for its possible involvement. This is probably best seen in 1940 when Congress implemented the first ever peacetime draft in U.S. history. By March of 1941, Congress had given the President the so-called Lend-Lease Authority to lend or lease supplies to any nation he felt was vital to American defense. Germany was seen as a major threat. However, it was American relations with Japan which brought the United States into an active role in World War II. The lecture will now explore some background information which resulted in the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Just as Germany had tried to expand its territory in the 1930s, Japan did the same thing in the Pacific. First of all, Japan occupied Manchuria, which was part of China, in order to gain access to raw materials like coal, oil, and timber. They also occupied the French colony of Indochina, also known as Vietnam. In response, the United States froze all Japanese assets and cut off all trade, including fuel, to Japan. The Japanese responded with a gamble. They gambled that an attack on Pearl Harbor would be kind of a knockout punch, demoralizing the United States while destroying the Pacific Fleet. They caught the Americans completely by surprise. In late November 1941, a Japanese task force left Japan and maintained radio silence. Their goal was to attack the U.S. naval base in Hawaii. Ultimately, they were very successful, as is seen with these statistics on the left. However, the United States was lucky. It was lucky because three aircraft carriers were out on maneuvers, and those carriers would be the key to fighting a modern war in the Pacific. The Japanese had hoped that the United States might not recover from the attack, but instead it rallied support throughout the entire nation and completely united the American people in support of the war effort. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor, a day which would live in infamy, in the words of Franklin Roosevelt, Congress declared war, and the United States became an active participant with the Allied powers. 
Next, the lecture will investigate some of the diplomacy associated with the war by focusing on profiles of the so-called Big Three. The approach here is to provide some biographical information about the leaders of the Allied nations during the war. First, we'll explore a bit about who they are. Then, we'll survey the goals and strategies they believed would lead the Allies to victory in World War II. The first of the big three I'd like to mention would be Winston Churchill. He was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. He had his goal for victory in World War II. He continually argued that they should attack Germany through the so-called soft underbelly of Europe. Do you know what that would be? Italy. Churchill's argument was that German defenses were too strong in northern and western Europe and so the attack had to come from someplace else. Allied forces instead should attack German troops in North Africa, as shown on this map, and then continue up the boot of Europe, Italy, and attack Germany from the south. The second member of the Big Three was Joseph Stalin. He was the leader of the Soviet Union at this time. His goal was the creation of a second front in Western Europe because the Soviets bore the brunt of Germany's attacks. The number of Soviet deaths outnumbered the deaths of all the Allied powers combined during the war, and so Stalin sought relief for his nation. Stalin was promised a second front early in the war, but it didn't come until 1944, which led to a lack of trust on Stalin's part. The final member of the Big Three I'd like to mention would be Franklin Roosevelt. He was the President of the United States during the Great Depression and New Deal, but he was also President during most of World War II. His goal was to defeat Germany first with the fewest number of American casualties. Now, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had brought the United States into the war, but Hitler's Germany was seen as a bigger threat. Here we see a photograph of Roosevelt and Churchill together in August of 1941. The two had developed a friendship in the years before the war. The first time the Big Three all met together was in 1943 in Tehran. At that time, Roosevelt tried to develop a personal relationship with Stalin. At times, he even referred to him as Uncle Joe. Now that the different strategies have been discussed, I'd like to talk about steps that led to the end of the war, first of all, with Germany. Some of the bloodiest fighting in the Second World War took place in Stalingrad from August of 1942 to January of 1943. During these four months, the Soviet Union saw more deaths than the United States did during the entire war. In the end, Russian forces defeated the Germans and forced them to retreat. This was important because it was a turning point in the fighting in Europe. This map identifies the location of Stalingrad in southern Russia. It was an important region strategically because of its proximity to Russia's oil reserves. If Germany had captured this territory, it would have severely damaged Russia's ability to fight. The liberation of Europe was one step closer to coming about with the largest amphibious invasion in world history in June of 1944. This was the Allied invasion in western France. This involved over 200,000 Allied troops from the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and France. 11,000 aircraft, 4,000 vessels had to be coordinated by the leader of this invasion, American General Dwight David Eisenhower. The red arrow on this map identifies the location of the D-Day invasion, Normandy, France. Finally, the second front that Joseph Stalin had been looking for took place. Once the beaches in Normandy had been secured, reinforcements followed. One late German offensive began in December of 1944 in the so-called Battle of the Bulge. Hitler's reserve units embarked in an assault on Allied forces in an attempt to disrupt the flow of supplies to the Allies through Belgium. Following several weeks of heavy fighting, German troops were forced to retreat as an end to the fighting in Europe seemed to be drawing near. Possibly the most important wartime conference involving the Big Three took place at Yalta in February of 1945. The mood at the conference was very positive as the course of the war in Europe had clearly swung in favor of the Allied powers. 
Several important issues were discussed at the Alta Conference as the Allied powers tried to decide what they should do following the defeat of Germany. First of all, free elections would be held after the war in Poland. Secondly, they decided that Germany would be occupied by the Allied powers. Third, the Soviet Union reaffirmed that it would join the war against Japan and declare war against Japan between two and three months following the defeat of Germany. Lastly, the Allied powers agreed that they would participate in the United Nations. About one week following the death of Adolf Hitler, Germany agreed to unconditional surrender on May 8, 1945. Victory in Europe had been achieved. Next, we'll explore some of the steps which resulted in the defeat of Japan during the Second World War. Because distances were so great in the Pacific, the United States couldn't simply invade Japan. So instead, the United States adopted a strategy of island hopping. This involved American forces traveling from island to island in the Pacific as they got closer and closer to the Japanese mainland. This map identifies the major battles in the Pacific as the United States adopted the policy of island hopping. Beginning with Pearl Harbor, the United States seized strategic islands in the Pacific and then used them as bases to push closer and closer to the Japanese mainland. One important battle in the war in the Pacific was the Battle of Midway, which took place in June of 1942. Midway was the location of an important U.S. outpost in the Pacific between Hawaii and Japan. The United States won a decisive victory, in part because it was helped by the U.S. Signal Corps, which had broken the Japanese code. The U.S. sunk four Japanese aircraft carriers and numerous other planes. This was significant because it was the turning point in the war in the Pacific. The war in the Pacific was particularly bloody, as depicted in this painting by Tom Lovell. Fighting in Tarawa took place in November of 1943, where more than a thousand Americans were killed. About 2,000 were wounded. This can be compared to about 5,000 Japanese deaths, a 5 to 1 ratio. Iwo Jima was a tiny island 700 miles from Japan. Fighting there took place early in 1945, which led to about 27,000 American casualties. About one-third of all Marines killed during the entire Pacific War died while fighting at Iwo Jima. As the Americans drew closer to the Japanese mainland, the number of kamikaze attacks, or suicide missions, increased dramatically. In addition to this, the city of Tokyo was firebombed over two days in March of 1945. This left over 80,000 people dead, primarily civilians, over 200,000 buildings were destroyed, as a 16 square mile stretch of the city was targeted for destruction. Yet the Japanese continued to fight. Fighting in Okinawa, only 350 miles from Japan, was even bloodier. About 12,000 American soldiers died and 40,000 were wounded. This can be compared to 110,000 Japanese military dead and about 80,000 Japanese civilians who were either killed or wounded. Yet the Japanese continued to fight on. In April of 1945, Roosevelt was having his portrait painted in Warm Springs, Georgia. At one point, he clutched his head and claimed that he had a terrible headache. What he had was a cerebral hemorrhage. He died later that day. Following the death of Franklin Roosevelt, the Vice President, Harry Truman, took over the reins of the presidency. Truman was a former senator from Missouri, and a lot of people didn't know who he was because he had only served as vice president for a short period of time. In fact, Roosevelt and Truman hadn't developed a very close working relationship, and Truman had no prior knowledge of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was a secret U.S. project to build an atomic bomb. It employed over 120,000 people in various parts of the nation, and cost the taxpayers over two billion dollars. Following the successful detonation of an atomic bomb in late July 1945, Harry Truman warned the Japanese to surrender or face utter destruction. 
The United States fully expected to invade Japan, and if that was to take place, the expectation was that American casualties, as well as Japanese casualties, would be incredibly high. Because the Japanese refused to surrender, an atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Immediately, about 100,000 were either killed or injured. Over the next several years, possibly as many as 100,000 more died as a result of the burns and exposure to radiation. Three days later, on August 9th, a second bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. Immediately, nearly 60,000 people were killed, thousands more over the next several years. A little less than a week later, on August 14, 1945, Japan surrendered and the Second World War came to an end. News of the Japanese surrender spread quickly, and here we see a spontaneous celebration in the streets of Hawaii in August of 1945. Now that we've studied some of the important concepts associated with World War II, we can review some of the main ideas discussed today. World War II was the most devastating war in world history, and by working together, the Allied powers were able to defeat Germany, Italy, and Japan. However, once that victory was complete and their common enemy was defeated, the alliance began to crumble, particularly as tension developed between the Americans and the Soviet Union. On another note, the use of the atomic bomb by the United States has been questioned by many since 1945. Was it justified? Why or why not? This concludes lecture number nine. I hope you learned something new. The next few slides will show some of the sources used for this presentation, as well as a list of hyperlinks for more information concerning the subject, including some websites with documents relating to the American use of an atomic bomb in World War II.